Hi, I'm Pam DeMoff, and I'm the Member of Parliament for Oakville, North Burlington. I'm joining our conversation today from the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And I'm thrilled that we have uh, Valerie and Jai King, who are going to uh, open our, our panel discussion in a good way. Valerie is a, a knowledge keeper from the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. So uh, I will turn it over to you, Valerie. Miigwech, Pam, and miigwech for the invite. Uh, I am honored um, to open to do the opening for this event. And my name is Adebora Gichidakwe which means she who speaks the truth, woman warrior leader. And I've been a member of Mississaugas of the Credit all my life. I do a lot of work uh, advocating, advocating uh, for missing and murdered Indigenous women. I do ceremonies and I help... Uh, I do counseling and holistic healing with the people here or women's groups or moon ceremonies, things like that. And I also have a big family. I have seven, uh, six girls and one son, and we all sing and we all do hand drum singing and the big drum. And I have seven grandchildren. And this is one of my daughters that's gonna sing with me today. And she's my technical person. Mm -hmm. This is. Uh, Dijna Kaz Moko Adoro, New Credit Donju, um, uh, Mississauga and Dao, meanwhile, uh, Six Nations of the Grand River. Um, so my name is Wild Bloom Purple Flower Woman. I'm from the Mississaugas of the Credit, I'm Bear Clan. And my father is uh, Ongahoe Mohawk from the Six Nations of the Grand River. Um, and I like to acknowledge both sides of my family um, and where I come from. I, once again, I want to uh, say miigwech Pam for, for uh, creating more education and awareness around systemic racism towards our people. And um, I want to acknowledge uh, Debbie and uh, uh, Sister Jade and uh, the one who created the film. I can't see without my glasses. I can't remember the name <laughs> And I'm terrible with names. Um, so anyway, I want to thank for that, that film that was done. Um, so this is a song that, one of the songs that came to Jai and we're gonna sing this song. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Hey, 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 hey,
Oh. Thank you. Hi, hi. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you, Miigwech. That was uh, that was beautiful, and um, I think all of us feel in our hearts that it's the uh, it's a way to start this very difficult discussion in a good way. So thank you to you both for uh, for for being with us to do that for us. Um, if if we were in person, I could give you a gift of tobacco. Unfortunately. <laughs> We're all virtual, so just just know that gesture has has been offered. Um, so I want to thank everyone who's who's tuned in. Um, we have um, encouraged everyone in in my writing to watch the doc the the film. We will stand up. And joining me today is Debbie Baptiste, who is Colton Bushy's mom, uh, Jay Tatusis, his sister. Tasha Hubbard, a filmmaker, educator, and director of the film, and Eleanor Sunchild, Sunchild who is a family friend and lawyer. So um, thank you so much for, for being with me today to talk about um, not just uh, Colton and the film, but also systemic racism that uh, Indigenous peoples face across Canada. So um, I've had the good fortune of meeting Debbie, Jade, and Tasha in person before. Um, we screened this, this film in Ottawa back in February pre-COVID. I've had the opportunity now to watch it three times. And every time I watch it, I think I take something new away from it. But I think at the heart of this film is, is, um, is Colton. And I wonder, Debbie and Jade, could you just talk a little bit about um, who Colton was? Um, I'll go first and say a few words and then I'll let Jade speak. Um, where did I do, what did I do with it? Okay, I had a picture in my son, I was just gonna show it and um, I don't know what I did with it, but maybe later. Colton was the most kind-hearted person you would have met. He was so smart. He always managed to make you smile. When you were having a bad day, he would always turn it around for you and really had a kind heart. Education was really important for him. He wanted to... Um, Go to the university. Wanted a lot of things he wanted to do with his life and he got cut short. I miss him every day. And I, mean, always, I, I can't wished, imagine. Always wish this like never happened, but it did. And we continue moving forward and uh, telling his story. Uh, other people out there are also grieving and fighting for justice that they never got. But we, the ladies and people behind us in Turtle Island all decided to stand up and say no more, no more people walking away, getting acquitted from committing a murder. And this is what we're pushing out there is that you stand up for yourself justice I mean don't back off from nothing you just keep going and that's what we wanted my son should have lived a full life but he got cut off and he was the most kind-hearted person you would have ever met but yeah my heart still hurts a lot it feels like it's never gonna heal but I'm making by doing this documentary and talking more about it, the healing continues to go with each time I speak. So I'm just grateful that you're all here today to talk about Colton and then the film. And then I feel so honored to be here today. And I'll let Jay speak now. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Thank you, uh, Jai, and to your daughter for, for bringing the good medicine of the drum and the music that, uh, that um, 
brings a lot of emotions, a little sadness, but, but mostly strength. And it can be a little overwhelming, but it, it definitely is appreciated. So I uh, thank you for that. Um, and thank you for, for making this space for us to gather and talk today, Pam. It's good to see you again, even virtually. And uh, even with my family, we're all in diff we're all like isolating and keeping safe in our own home fires. So it's nice to see my, my auntie and my friends, Tash and Eleanor as well. Um, but yeah, my, my brother Colton, he, um, when I think about him now, I, I, I mostly smile. I used to get really angry and sad, but I just remember his, his kind eyes, his smile, his, his, his shy laughter, you know, um, <laughs> uh, he was, he was a goofy, goofy guy that, uh, he, you know, if you, if you asked him to do something, he would try it out. Even if it was, uh, something you haven't seen him do before. I remember going to a round dance in Red Pheasants and, uh, all of a sudden he was walking around with this giant TV that he was raffling off for the family and, you know, kept making jokes that he was going to teeter over with it because it was about the size of him. But <laughs> um, he was one of those people that would pitch in in the community and help out where he can. And uh, he liked to socialize, you know, he made friends wherever he went and he would definitely sit down and have a cup of coffee with you and, and just ask how you're doing. And, uh, you know, crack a few jokes and maybe play some Kaiser, play some cards. He really enjoyed doing that with his brothers back at home. And um, those are the things that come to mind now when I when I think of my brother, I like remembering, remembering the individual he was. And like my auntie said, uh, we miss him deeply at every holiday, every, um, every, every ceremony, you know, we think of him and we pray that he is well where he is at. And, uh, and, um, you know, that one day we will see him again. But in the meantime, we'll continue to to speak his name and, and tell who he was to us, but also to address what happened to him so that it doesn't happen to, to others. So we just well, continue to do that. Thank you for, for sharing that because so often um, people can be defined by one incident and Colton should never be defined by this one incident, you are, are taking it upon yourselves to make change because of what happened. But there was so much more to him than, than just this one thing. So I, I thank you both for sharing um, just a little piece of him with us so that we can feel the same kind of uh, joy and laughter that you shared uh, with someone so important to you. Um, so how are you now? I mean, what and what's happened since what was shown in the film? Um, maybe everyone could uh, um, speak to that. Tasha, maybe could we start with you and you could just give us a little background on, on the film and, um, and then how, you know, what's happened since, since it was made. And then we'll, we'll go to each of you if that's okay. Yeah. Thank you, Pam. Um, yeah. So the film was released in, in uh, April, 2019 um, at the hot dogs festival in Toronto, and then did a number of festivals. Uh, we had a theatrical run across the country. And we also did a lot of community screenings where, um, you know, libraries, justice groups, education groups uh, could request the film. A lot of times, you know, as much as possible, you know, we, uh, Debbie, Jade, Eleanor, myself, uh, occasionally Sheldon would, would come and speak to the film. Um, you know, and, and our intention always was, you know, in terms of this film was, you know, the concern that myself and many others had about how this case would, would, would go through the legal system and what would happen at the end of it. Um, and also to give the opportunity for a, a family, a, you know, an Indigenous family to, uh, to speak to their experiences going through the legal system and, you know, what happens when, you know, they're met with, um, you know, with, with essentially adversity and hostility and, and, and injustice in the different places in which uh, they, you know, they had to go. Um, and, you know, so the, you know, we've had a really strong reception for the film. We've had, you know, thousands of people have watched it, whether it's been streaming or in person or 
on our broadcast. And, um, you know, we, we feel fortunate for the reach of the film. I think, you know, the hope is that, you know, on an individual level that people, you know, reflect on the experiences of Indigenous families when, when they, uh, you know, they are victims of violence and what happens, you know, what kinds of support is there and, and, you know, but also, you know, you know, our, our, our I think all, all of our goal, um, and I'll, you know, maybe Eleanor can speak to this, but uh, more, but, you know, in terms on a, an institutional and systemic level, you know, we, we hope that the, the film would have an impact that, you know, that it would shine, you know, we talk about documentaries shining a light. Well, this was a pretty big spotlight on it, troubles and, you know, trouble spots and, you know, gaps and, uh, you know, and major issues that exist um, that that haven't been listened to. You know, it's not that families have haven't tried. You know, it's it's just it's often met, um, you know, by their indifference or or silence. So, you know, we're we're hoping the the film continues to to reverberate in those spaces. And and maybe Eleanor can speak more about because I you know there have been developments uh, within uh, legal spaces as well. Eleanor. Yeah, thank you, Tash, for those comments. Uh, we've been pushing, of course, with the film to talk about systemic racism. Eleanor, uh, your sound, your sound is is funny. Yeah, there's a bit of a feedback. Again. There's feedback on it. Is it better now, or it wasn't there before? It's odd. Why don't we go to um, oh. Jade or Debbie? What? Oh. Better? No. Yeah. Eleanor, do you want to try logging out and logging back yeah. in, and maybe sure. maybe Debbie or or Jade could could say a few words while you're doing that? Oh, okay. There we go. Go ahead, Debbie. Okay. What was um the question again? Just what what's hap Well, how are you doing? And you sort of spoke about that already, but but also what's happened since the the film was made? And I think I'd also want to say, like, are you starting to see any change? I don't really see any change. I see people still struggling, still not being heard. Um, I don't see any change at all, and it just seems like. Um, well, it's hard to say with the quarantine going on and you really don't go anywhere and you do hear a few things on Facebook, but as it is, I haven't heard, I have, I feel like there hasn't been really any kind of change or any move ahead and uh, racism continues on in those courtrooms and I see uh, the injustice that the, our younger generations going through is just that they're, you know, as soon as they turn 15, 16, they're already locked up. They're locked up until their teenage years are done. And then, and then when they get older, in their 20s, and then they're in their, then they do another stretch. And it just continues on in a cycle. So they think it's okay to just start locking up our young people at a young age. And it'd be over something you know just petty and then you know and if if that was a uh, say a Munoz kid they let them go but for a native kid no they're gonna they're gonna keep them in a system and that's where they stay so we have it just continues going and then somehow we need to break that cycle where give the opportunity to, for our young people to live a normal life where they can have education freedom where they can walk around without worrying over their shoulder if the cops are following on the, following them or if they're going to come home that night you know we still live that way nothing to me has really changed jade i'm just echoing a bit off of what my auntie said you know um we still have families that that lose a loved one and you know they've expressed to us that their first thought is is us and and knowing our story and what we had to face and the the injustice and the the racism and just the the various barriers and then to have an acquittal at the end you know like they're when they lose a loved one it's already hard enough but they're 
they, they get anxious knowing that what they're going to face when it comes to the judicial system and the, the process. And so they reach out to us, you know, what should I do? What, you know, this is happening or I'm not getting information. And, you know, like they continue to reach out and ask and all we can do is share our experience and, and what has been done for us and uh, try to think of ways to better inform families and families and friends of families to support them. So uh, one of the things that we've been a part of as far as uh, creating a resource for families that, that lose a loved one to, to violence and in, an Indigenous family. And we've done that in collaboration with a couple, with uh, several academics and friends that are knowledgeable in this area. But um, this is a reactive approach. This is knowing that it's going to happen again and being able to support families but that's the thing is it needs to change when it comes to social, to society, but also to the systems themselves and how they treat indigenous families and victims of violence. There's still so much work that needs to be done. Um, but I know there have been uh, a few changes as Tasha mentioned within the legal area and uh, um, you know, Eleanor is back with us. So let's, let's okay, hope her, her a little bit okay. You know, I, I, just while she's finishing connecting, I'm going to say uh, we had Robin Maynard at the Public Safety Committee this week, this week, last week, who wrote the, the book um, Policing Black Lives. And I asked her if uh, about, you know, the over policing, which we know exists for Indigenous peoples, where their, their Indigenous peoples are over policed, as are Black Canadians. And I said, you know, can you clarify whether public safety is actually enhanced by having an increased police presence? And I was just looking while we were talking, her quote was, healthy food and decent housing is something that provides much more safety than law enforcement officers can. I, I think that, you know, I don't think you get a more profound uh, quote than that when you're looking at community safety in terms of, of uh, you know, what you were talking about, Debbie, ensuring that young Indigenous kids can, can grow up to get an education and live a life of freedom. So, Eleanor, we're going to keep our fingers crossed. That can you hear me? Much better. Yes. Okay. Actually, I plugged in. To the network. Okay. Instead of doing Wi-Fi. So I just had to move move the office I was in. Well, it's much better. And I'm um, you know, being being a, a lawyer too, can you maybe talk about what's what's happened since the, the film was made? Yes. So there's uh the complaints, of course, against the RCMP and then the civil lawsuit against the RCMP, those are ongoing. There was also the uh, intervention by Debbie in the Supreme Court of Canada case that eliminated preemptory challenges and the Supreme Court upheld the elimination of preemptory challenges. So, so for anybody watching who doesn't know what that is, I mean, Debbie was quite profound in the in in the film uh, when when you were looking at the the jurors. But could you, Eleanor, maybe explain what that is and why it's so important? In a trial uh, such as Gerald Stanley's trial, each side, the Crown and the defense, had use of a tool called preemptory challenges. So using preemptory challenges, the lawyers could exclude any juror based on how they looked or how they presented themselves. And all that the lawyers would have to say is challenge and they would be gone. So how it ended up in the Gerald Stanley trial being an all white jury was through the use of preemptory challenges because there weren't enough indigenous jurors in the jury pool to outnumber the use of preemptory challenges. So therefore each and every single indigenous juror or indigenous looking juror even was challenged. And then an all white jury was the result. So it's been our position throughout this whole um, ordeal that had there been maybe one or two or even three indigenous jurors on the jury in Battleford, where there is a high population of Indigenous people, that may have resulted in a different, a different um, verdict, or at least it would have gave the appearance of a non-biased jury. 
because one person, one indigenous person in a room, if there's uh, stereotypes and discrimination being tossed around, often if that indigenous person speaks up, they can challenge those stereotypes and biases. Now we'll never know how the jury came to the verdict that they did, of course, because we're, we, in Canadian law, we're not allowed to ask the, jur the jurors um, how they decided the verdict. However, had there had been uh, at least one Indigenous juror in that jury, um, it would have at least seemed unbiased or that the family had a chance. However, when the jury was all white, all non-native, uh, and we see that in the film and Debbie's reaction to, to finding out that there was uh, just all non-native people on that jury, her reaction was, well, like, huh, you know, do we have a chance? And that was the whole point of our challenge to preemptory challenges was to give families from this moment forward a fighting chance. Well, that social context is so important, right? Of when when um, people are coming into the the um, uh, well, any situation, but in this particular case, the into the jury to bring that social context with them and and life experience. And um, Debbie, I got the sense when you found out the jury, it was almost like you weren't surprised and that this is kind of how this just one more um, one more way that systemic racism has tried to beat your family down. Yeah, I wasn't surprised because all along I felt like we didn't have a chance but at least we, we had to try. We had to try no matter what. We had to have that hope that the justice system was fair. And um, it wasn't. And the man walked away that committed a murder. And he's, you know, he's just walking around like a free man, like he didn't commit a murder. And he committed a sin when he should be locked up where he should do his time like any other criminal that commits a crime. So this man walked away free and that just, you know, we cannot have that happen ever again to anybody where a murderer walks free, you know, they, they need a, that man needed to go to prison. So anybody else that thinks they're gonna, you know, have a shooting day with killing off native kids, it's time they go to jail and pay the price. You do the crime, do the time. So Gerald Stanley should have did the time, but he didn't. And that's Saskatchewan for you. It's fixed. So people like him walk away free and, get a, and also get a GoFundMe page for killing someone. And so that's how I feel on it. I'm still sorry. I'm still angry about it. So you don't have to apologize, Debbie, okay. at all. Um, I know... Can I just maybe add to that, Pam? Uh, you know, yeah. we we were there at the jury selection, and I, I, you know, of course we can't film, um, but we went to observe. But you know, as a filmmaker, there's always spaces where you know you don't always have the access. But you know, I would have, you know, we were there to be able to show Debbie's response when when Jade came to tell her. But you know, uh, I was sitting there with with Chris Murphy, who was one of the lawyers and, and Jade, and we were, you know, we were watching this happen, watching these indigenous people, but even before they, they brought the indigenous, you know, the, the first 40 to go, um, you know, there were people who were saying to the judge that they were biased and that they had had thefts happen and they were still like, oh, okay, that's fine you know, you're still part of the jury pool. And it's like, they're just telling you that they're biased. And it, how is that okay that these people are still deemed to be potential jurors? Um, you know, when you have, there were five indigenous people standing up ready to serve, you know, and, and, and had done so thoughtfully and, you know, 
with with the serious weight that that this child deserved um you know and and the you know and, and i you know i i know for me it was disheartening to watch and i i really you know it's one of those times where i'm like i really wish people could see you know what it was like for them to 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 have to step down so i think it might be a, a good time to talk about the um what has happened with the complaint that was filed about the RCMP? I mean, you know, there were the so much of of the the issues were were documented in the film, Debbie. The way you were treated to when you found out that um, your son had been killed, um, a moment no mother ever wants to face, and certainly does not expect to be treated like a criminal at that time and you know issues with evidence and so one of the things I know Jade you had a question for me <laughs> about what I've done but maybe can we start a little bit back before that just about the the uh, complaint filed with the uh, Civilian Review and Complaints Commission and when that was and uh, what's happened since then. Eleanor do you want to do you want to start with that maybe? Certainly. So after, even before the trial, there was a complaint that was launched by Alvin Baptiste into how, um, how the family had been treated, uh, how Debbie had been treated, and that, that complaint was not successful. However, after the trial, uh, we met with some high officials uh, in the RCMP. Curtis Lobaki was one of them, and he initiated the complaint on his on his own. He said, "If we initiate this complaint, then it will get a priority treatment, and hopefully, it will go through uh, the system in a timely manner, which it has not to this point." And when um, was that? That was right after the trial. So it would have been around, oh, that time is such a blur, but around February, like the end of February. Uh, 2018 mid, though, right? Yeah, mid to end of February that, that yeah. complaint. We had that meeting in Saskatoon. Yeah, um, I don't think the month, month matters, but it was, it was well over two years ago. Right, well over two years ago. So uh, the family was interviewed, uh, the lawyers were interviewed and they conducted a number of interviews with other people as well, the RCMP members. And now it sits with the RCMP. I'd just like to talk a little bit more about how, how Debbie was treated that night. Yeah. I'm sorry, Debbie. Uh, I'm sorry, Debbie, to talk about this again. We do have a lawsuit against a civil lawsuit against the RCMP about what happened the night Colton was shot. So the night that Colton died, they informed Debbie that her son was deceased by entering her trailer on Red Pheasant with their weapons drawn and without a warrant searching her premises. She was told by one of the officers, your son is dead. And she then fell to the floor in disbelief. Someone, one of the officers then said, um, have you been drinking? And I don't, like the basis of that is, is what her falling to the floor in agony and disbelief. Like it just doesn't seem that a grieving mother's, like the RCMP's response should have been, are you drinking? And that is, is one of the first inc incidents of systemic racism that we see in this case because um, assumingly they have a belief that because she's an indigenous woman, uh, she had probably been drinking. So there was like, absolutely no compassion or empathy displayed towards her. her but even the way they entered the home, Eleanor? I know, even the way they entered the home. Uh, with guns drawn and what were they looking for? Probably they were looking for um, stolen property or maybe one of the indigenous, uh, one of the indigenous men who were in the vehicle who walked away. Uh, 
I'm not sure exactly what they were searching for, but it wasn't to be compassionate uh, to tell Debbie in a death notification that her son had died. Like they they have procedures, they have processes for death notifications, and this was not one of them at all. So that that started the whole. Uh, journey into systemic racism that this family has faced right from that moment, right from how they treated her, how they, um, you know, treated the memory of her, her deceased son, like, like he was a thief, like he was a criminal. And, and so um, the complaint, you know, we're still waiting for it. And, and that in itself too is, is systemic racism, because it shouldn't take two years to have this complaint presented to the family. Uh, I, I'm assuming that, that there are uh, some very large uh, blatant truths in that report and perhaps that's why it's not being presented yet. But we're waiting, we're waiting and we're ready for it. Jade, go ahead. But this just raises further issues, you know, for a family that goes through an experience such as ours to ha then have to file a complaint and then to have to follow up and then to have to wait, you know, that any any sort of hope, you know, is just kind of sucked out of you. It's drained from you. You're exhausted. You're grieving. Um, and at some point, you know, it's just like, where where is the justice? Who, who, where in the system is justice served for Indigenous people? How is it accessible? Because at this point, even with filing a complaint, it doesn't feel accessible because we're still waiting. We're still advocating. We're still pushing. And we're being told, you know, it's in the hands of those who committed the injustice and we have to wait on them now. And that's not fair. That just adds to another, another thing that we're sitting and, um, and it, it's like things have to change. The system has to change in the way it, uh, it supposedly delivers justice to all has to change because it doesn't. And, and the fact that it's taken so long means that any recommendations that are in there um, have not been implemented for the two years since, uh, since the complaint was filed, which means that um, who knows uh, how many other Indigenous peoples have been um, have faced the same kind of systemic racism that your family faced, Debbie and Jade. Um, so, on that, just to to give you a little bit of an update, um, as you know, I met with with uh, you back in February when you were in Ottawa. You you had a, a number of meetings. You've been to Ottawa twice. I I just met you in February, but since then, um, shortly afterwards, I did ask the commissioner when the report was coming and. Uh, she, you know, had an answer. I don't remember what it was back then. Uh, but then this summer, um, I worked with Jack Harris from the NDP. I was reappointed to the Public Safety Committee, and we brought an emergency motion to public safety to study uh, systemic racism in policing, and in particular, the RCMP. So I've now asked the commissioner three times um, every appearance that she's had since the summer when that report was coming and most recently was this week when she committed that since the last time I asked her she had asked her staff to uh, get moving on it and that she would have the report on December the 4th and that she would spend the weekend reviewing it and it would be released shortly after that so that gives your family a timeline it does not solve the problem that it's taken two and a half years and there still remain 149 other complaints um, with the RCMP, some one that's four years old, um, where they have not responded to them. So I've brought this up with Minister Blair and he uh, is also extremely concerned about the timeline and has made a commitment that either through regulation or legislation that there will be timelines put on these reports. Um, I wonder what your thoughts are, and we didn't talk about this before, but one of the things the RCMP has um, 
said they were going to do was was to invest in body worn cameras that would cost 50 million dollars. Um, I'm, I'm of the opinion and the empirical evidence on this and the studies that have been done have shown that they have minimal to no impact on police behavior. And if you look at what happened to Chief Adam in, in, um, in, in Alberta, you can see that there was actually video evidence of what had happened to him and it was still dismissed by the RCMP. So I'm of the opinion that that $50 million would be better spent on accountability and consequences for um, the police service, the RCMP. I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that. Uh, can I'll just maybe, there's something that I, I've, you know, been watching and, and, and I mean, we, you know, we have seen both the commissioner um, and also, um, you know, the uh, commander of, uh, I guess is now he's in, in Alberta, but at the time that this happened, he was the commanding officer in Saskatchewan, Curtis Ablocki, and both Brenda Lucky and Curtis Ablocki are, you know, are, are on the record for denying the existence of systemic racism uh, in the RCMP, which is, you know, frankly, laughable. It's laughable, but it's deeply concerning because these are people leading, you know, the leading and who, you know, we, we know that there are cases again and again of issue of violence coming from the RCMP against Indigenous people. You know, we're seeing deaths in custody. We're seeing, you know, all of the, we're seeing, and who knows, you know, how many cases aren't being investigated thoroughly because the people who are the victims are not valued and not seen as, as fully human by the national police force. And, you know, I'll just say like, we tried to interview Curtis Zablocki for the film and, and initially he agreed. And we were also trying to film the parade um, and it was two separate, two separate things we were trying to do. And then we got given a, 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 a contract that said, you know, you can only do this uh, if we have editorial control. And, and, then, and then they had a non-disclosure agreement added to this contract. And it's like, we pushed back on that. And we're like, we can't give the RCMP editorial control of a documentary film. And, you know, they said, oh, well, we've had other people sign it. And so we did research and we asked other filmmakers who had made films with the RCMP and they all didn't, they said, no, we were not asked to sign anything like that. You know, it was a good, good faith. And I, I said, you know, they said, oh, we don't want you to defame or discredit. And I'm like, we're not going to defame anybody. Like we have our own lawyers making sure that whatever we're saying is not defamation is based in truth. And, you know, I'm like, well, what does discredit actually mean? And I'm like, well, it means harm the reputation of. And I'm like, so what you're telling me is I can't put anything in this film that's going to harm your reputation, even if it's just speaking the truth of your own actions. And that's really worrying. And so, you know, all of these actions to me speak about this narrative that they want to have, that that's what's important, you know, their reputation, their brand. And yet, you know, we're seeing all of these incidents and it's, deeply concerning. And I think Canadians in general need to really, you know, take the time to, to, to look into this and that there needs to be pressure, you know, the, what happened to this family, how they were treated, there were not, you know, there have not been consequences for the officers involved, for their leadership, for, you know, and, and frankly, to sit on this report, you know, it's, it is really concerning. And, it, and, you know, we know that there's been this pressure coming from other places as well as yourself, and there's still not been this response. And so, you know, I, I, I'm glad and I'm really curious what's going to come out on December 4th. Yeah. It also um, just increases the pain that, that uh, the family has to go through and not knowing, um, you know, the not knowing and, and, it, knowing that there's something sitting there and not knowing if it's, you know, when it's, it just keeps going and going and going and, and not being able to know, have closure on that part of, of your life. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I think uh, in terms of the stuff that I've been doing, <laughs> Uh, Jada, because I know you were you were interested in that um, when when um, 
the the house prorogued, I also wrote interim recommendations that I had, which I sent to the Prime Minister's office and to Minister Blair, because the committee hasn't finished its study yet. It's going to be finished um, next week. Um, I've also um, um, been quite active on this file with, um, with the minister and expressing my opinions quite um, forcefully and publicly. I mean, I, I'm not, I haven't ha ha made secrets of how I feel about the, uh, the, the system. I mean, if RCM Depot, the training center is on the site where Louis Rayal was hanged. I think that speaks volumes to the philosophy of um, the service. Mm -hmm. um, if you, uh, you, Anyway, I could go on and on about that. But did you have any other questions for me, Jade? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just... Or Natasha? To... Sure, go ahead. And then we can... But, you know, I'll, I'll just say this, that, that I think, you know, this is, a, this is an issue where we have people in positions of power within the RCMP um, who haven't done their homework, who haven't looked back, who aren't, who aren't aware... Uh, of the history of policing and Indigenous people and, you know, are probably of the mind, well, you know, that's in the past, let's move on. But the reality is to, you know, we, you know, when you mentioned that they're training on that site, you know, it, you know, what is happening within those training spaces, um, you know, in terms of, you know, pushing back against the bias and the stereotypes that they come in with and that very likely their trainers and their commanding officers are working with as well. And like I said, if we have two people in leadership positions saying this, and of course they're backtracking now, but you know, I'd like to know what are you doing <laughs> to, to really understand systemic racism, to understand how the RCMP is a part of that, um, you know, so that the you know, families like uh, this family um, you know, aren't encountering this stuff. And, you know, I, I, I just, you know, I, I think that that's part of the, the need for, um, you know, a deep reckoning, you know, that, that comes in all levels of the legal system. You know, we've been talking about the RCMP, but I know there's been a lot of talk about the Crown Prosecuting, uh, the Crown Prosecutor's offices and decisions that are made within those spaces and how families are treated. I mean, this is something. Well, it's throughout the criminal justice system, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Um, you know, what's happening there. So that's my. So, so to folks that might be watching this, um, what can they do? Um, what actions can they take? Um, I actually have a number of people who are interested in being allies um, that live in, in my riding, what can they do to support your efforts? I'll, I'll start. I'd just like to point out that today is the 135th anniversary of the uh, men who were hung in Battleford uh, as a result of the rebellion. So th that history is in the film. Tasha did a really uh, excellent job of, of outlining that terrible event that lays the foundation of history and of the history of racism in Western Canada and lays, you know, the dealings of the RCMP with the Indigenous people in, in Saskatchewan and in Western Canada particularly. So today is their, the anniversary date of their, their death. So I think that we should acknowledge that and never forget. Because that, that also results in racism, um, primarily how the family was treated. Uh, it's all, it all roots back to, to that and the dishonoring of treaties and um, the injustice that people have suffered. To get back to your question, Pam, the family deserves nothing less than, uh, you, you know, there's no, there, there's no appeal. There's, there's not going to be an appeal on this because the Saskatchewan government, instead of issuing an appeal, had a press conference. Had a press conference not to appeal. So the criminal part of, of the killing of Colton Bushi is, is done. 
However, there is a story that needs to be told and there needs to be uh, a Royal Commission into systemic racism. Uh, there needs to be some sort of public inquiry into how this case was handled. We won't get that here in this province with our current government. However, the federal government could hold a Royal Commission into, into systemic racism within the Canadian justice system. And that's something that, that should be pushed for. So any allies or people who want to support should write their MP, write the Minister of Justice, write the Prime Minister and push for uh, a Royal Commission into systemic Eleanor, racism. Eleanor, can I, can I push back a little bit on that though? There have been so many studies and so many recommendations made on this. Do we need another study or do we need action to be taken on we the- need action. I, I'm action. not, I'm not, I'm not trying to be difficult or obstinate, but it just seems even as the public safety committee is doing this study on systemic racism, it seems like we've been studying this for 30 years or more. And I think governments actually know what we need to do. Um, I think, I think we need to start putting into action the recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the, the calls to action in the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, uh, the, the numerous, numerous recommendations that have been made over the past decades. Um, I, I worry that studying it once again just delays the needed action that has to be taken. So perhaps they can work in tandem, but I, I would hate to see any action delayed because someone can say, well, we're studying it. So right. I, I, I just want to put that out there. Uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, is the experience of the Bushi family going into your report? on systemic racism? Um, yes, it will. So, so it's, I mean, I've certainly brought it up when I've been, when I've been speaking. So it's, it's not something that has been overlooked at all, Eleanor. Okay, good, good. Um, perhaps they could be done in tandem. Um, I mean, they're, the whole background and the whole ordeal really needs to come out. And, and I'm so thankful that Tasha made this movie to tell the story. But the wider people of Canada, general society, also needs to know the story. So whether that's, you know, done through... Uh, uh, movies, books, inclusion in reports, um, or other forms of advocacy, you know, that, that's all something that needs to be, we, we can't stop talking about Colton, we can't stop talking about this family, because we don't want more Indigenous men to die. We don't want the message to be that people can go around, um, targeting Indigenous people and get away with it. That's, that's another, as Minister of Safety, that's something that should be very important to you. Um, if you look at cases that have arisen since Colton shooting, such as the case of the Métis Hunters in Alberta, that's something that people need to, to, to watch and keep an eye on and comment about. I know there's a publication ban on that, but once that evidence comes out and that story comes out, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give it. Uh, we're probably gonna ha need to wrap this up, but I I know Jade, you looked like you wanted to say something as well. Um. Overall, I think what pe what Canadians can do uh, for our our settler Canadians, they can further educate themselves in terms of the history of the land to which they live on, to the space and place, and to, to be better informed and not to quickly jump to assumptions and latch onto the colonial narrative that Indigenous people are the cause for their pain or for their violence. And so reflecting on oneself, checking your privilege in the place and 
the place that you are in society. And if you are an ally, you know, using that privilege to make way for indigenous voices, indigenous truths, indigenous narratives, and bringing this film, showing this film to your family, to your friends, to your colleagues, you know, February 9th is a, is a historical day in Canada. It's the day that uh, we learn that indigenous people do not get justice through a, a judicial system, a colonial judicial system when Stanley was acquitted. February 9th is a day of action that we should always remember. We should always remember what happened on that day and ask ourselves what has changed since then. Instead of always asking us because we will reflect on it and continue to tell you our pain and what we're doing and pushing for, but ask yourselves what has changed since then and what can I do to be a part of that? that once again is sharing the story, but it's also, you know, maybe contributing to the, to the resources around you that, that uplift and support indigenous people, the friendship centers, uh, different organizations, but um, overall- We don't actually have a friendship center here in Halton. I'm actually working with some indigenous peoples uh, in, in, in Halton. I had a meeting with them last week. Um, so, you know, I think there's there's a lot that people can do. I would include in that sending, um, keeping pressure on politicians, yeah. um, like like myself, but others who um, need to also be be outspoken and um, and and push on on these issues and and amplify your voices, which I, I hope I've been able to do. So. Um, I just want to say thank you to all of you for for doing this. I I'm always struck by your ability to 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 tell Colton's story um, because it's your own story and it's your own family, Debbie and Jade. This isn't this isn't just a story that you're telling. It's 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 your own and. Um, it's it's just so powerful to me that you're that you continue to do it I know how important it is to you but um, to share that part of your heart with all of us I want you to know that it does make a difference and that mm. it's it's very much appreciated and I wonder if Debbie I could give the last word to you before we sign off sure well I found that picture I wonder if okay you let's see it <laughs> this is the one I was taking around with me everywhere I went. That's the one you had at the UN, right? This is, um, yeah. And he deserved to live. He deserved to have an education. He deserved to have freedom. He deserved to have children, grandchildren. And that's what I got to last say on that.